Just a couple quick notes on this episode. I just wanted to say that this is not a doctrinal argument. I think by the title, it could perhaps be misleading. Um, Jordan and I are not discussing whether politically and culturally charged topics such as gay marriage or transgender ideology or, you know, the sort are moral or immoral. And we're not even discussing the church's stance on it doctrinally. Um, Magdala is committed as an organization to obedience of the Roman Catholic Church. I cannot be clear enough on that. However, part of that obedience is also making sure that we're always loving as Christ does and making the church a more purified bride through encountering our brothers and sisters. That's what this episode is about. Um, I do also want to be clear that approaching same-sex attraction or LGBTQ identities and experiences is not the same as how Magdala approaches addictions to pornography and masturbation. We encounter many women who experience all of these things, (laughs) check all the boxes, if you will, but our goal is not to help people, quote unquote, recover from their LGBTQ identity or experiences, unless that individual expresses that their same-sex attraction is an unwanted result of their addiction that they wish to be free of as part of their recovery. Jordan is a testament, a beautiful, beautiful testament, if you listen to this episode, of finding peace and wholeness with her queer identity in the presence of Christ, and we want that message to be clear also. Pornography and masturbation are addictive behaviors and sins in the eyes of the church, and that's why recovery is the goal. Um, But a queer identity is not an addictive behavior or a sin in the eyes of the church. Um, You can look at the catechism numbers 2357 and 2359 if you want, or through 2359 if you want to see evidence of that. We're talking queer identities, not a sin. Um, In light of all this, I just ask that any comments trying to either correct Jordan or myself doctrinally are withheld. Um, And instead, the point of this discussion is just received for what it is, a conversation about how to encounter our brothers and sisters in Christ the way that they deserve. Thanks, guys, and enjoy the episode. Hey there, my name is Rachel Geiger, and welcome to the Magdala Podcast. We at Magdala know from experience that pornography, masturbation, and other sexual addictions are not just a guy problem. The need for women to be accompanied in the journey towards healing from addiction has gone sorely unmet, and that's why we're here. Magdala exists as a space where women can find hope, healing, and freedom alongside each other from sexual addiction. Our goal is to supply you with support, community, and accountability. Here on the podcast, you'll find everything from testimonies to practical advice to dialogue about how to heal and live fully as a Catholic woman. Wherever you are in your journey, know that you're not alone, and we welcome you to this table. Hello, everybody. I was about to take a sip of wine, and then I realized I actually need to intro the podcast. Welcome back to the Magdala podcast. Um, Today, we have Jordan, and Jordan and I are drinking wine, or maybe I'm just drinking wine. I don't even think you're drinking wine. I, I am not drinking wine, but that you know what? I'm drinking wine in spirit always, so I mean, go for it. I think that's, yeah, I think that's a way to live. Jordan and I were just sharing, we found in common that we are both nannies. Um, and we were talking about just the, I guess, the greatness that it brings to your lifestyle to be a nanny, an adult nanny. I, you know, like it's it's just truly a call to glory. It really is. And I think so many of us, especially like young women in our 20s, whether we're married or not, like just like the prospect of raising good kids and like kids that are grounded and kids that remain safe is like so overwhelming that it feels so much better to just like realize that a, you got to let go of the reins like yeah, on some things. Um, and like you were saying earlier, like not everything is a huge deal. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just is, is so equipping in so many ways. It's really beautiful. Yeah. It's professional development in its own way. And mm-hmm. it's been interesting because I was a nanny first when I was 17 and then throughout college and grad school and now I'm married and nannying and I kind of switch like I vacillate back and forth between like one day I'm like I really want a baby now like I I want a baby now and then other days like today I'm like yeah. no 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 <laughs> I'm just like I can I know. wait I can wait <laughs> we're good some days I call my partner Ned and I'm like I just want to be pregnant <laughs> And then like other day, other days, I'm like, I don't think that I want to be married, have children, be around other people ever again. I think I need to be in a great room alone with books forever. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm good on the whole thing. Maxed out. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think normal moms are that way though, where they're like, yeah, like, you know what? I'm, I'm done with the whole people thing. Like, I I feel like if I was a stay at home mom, that's what I would do. It's, you know. I'm quitting my messages so I don't get dings like while we're on. Yeah, I just yeah, I should do that thing. as well. Yeah, 
Yeah. And it's like, also, um, I always thought that like mothering would just be like, you just love these people, right? You just love these kids. It's just so easy and natural because they're of your body and blah, blah, blah. Right. And now I'm like, it is so hard to love somebody well. Mm. And I, and, and I watch these parents who are just overwhelmed pandemic four kids under the age of seven. And I'm like, the level of work that it is, the, the, the ferocity with which you have to try to love people well is just so yeah overwhelming, but it's also really beautiful. It's and so accurate. Yeah. I know these kids will see that in their parents and really appreciate it. But right now they're just like, if you don't do what I'm asking <laughs> you to do right now, like, Oh, yeah. I know. I, I love the parents that I work for and I'm definitely taking a lot of notes on some things they do. But today, I mean, I was trying to put the baby down for a nap and I think the same thing. I'm like, it's yeah. Just like offer every moment up as a sacrifice. Like, you know, like motherhood comes with so much sacrifice. Like you're just learning. And then like today I just was like swearing silently to myself. Like when this baby's like screaming in my ear and I'm like trying to pray a rosary at the same time to like calm down. And then I just start crying. And I was like, you know what? Like this is, Here we are. But I think, you know, it's just funny. Like I, people talk about the messiness of motherhood and I'm like, it, it must actually be as messy as they say. If, if, you know, the child I nanny can make me cry, you know, there, yeah. there has to be some reality to that. I mean, the mom that I work for is just like one of the most amazing mothers I've ever known. And mm. the other day I just watched her remain calm beyond what I thought was normal. Like <laughs> her two and a half year old took her glasses off her face just like looked at them, snapped an arm off the glasses mm. and then like wiped her nose full like snot oh, situation on yeah. her mom's shoulder. And like, I just would not have had the patience for like no. any part of that A to Z. She just like remained calm and was like, why did you just do that to mama? And I was like, what? Like, I, I just would have completely lost it. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. It's just, it's. That's virtue. And that's the virtuous yeah. life right there. Yeah. Why did you do that to mama? Not like throws child off lap. You lose her. Yeah. (laughs) Violently exits room. Like. (laughs) Oh, no, I get it. I strive to be that kind of person one day. God willing in my own family. But yeah. All right. Well, we can kick this kick this off get this show on the road. I was about to say kick this show on the road. I was like, that's not (laughs) that's not the phrase. Um. Okay, so Jordan, tell me a bit about yourself or tell the audience, I guess, a little bit about yourself or listeners about yourself. Where where are you? What are you doing other than nanny? You know, describe sure. yourself and your interests. Sure. So my name is Jordan Kennedy. I am from Detroit, Michigan. I was born and raised between the northwest side of Detroit um, and the west side of a neighboring city called Dearborn which is famous and popular in the world for having the largest um, concentration of Arab Americans and Muslims outside Mm -hmm. of the Middle East. And Mm -hmm. I got to say, what a blessing. Like I've just, I just grew up in a state of permanent encounter and friendship with, with Mm -hmm. Arabs and Muslims. And that I think has really, it's informed my own faith and how we're called to show up for people. It was just a huge part of my upbringing. That's was incredible. this proximity to this yeah. community, knowing their pain, knowing some of their sufferings, um, mm. and just seeing what mainstream depictions and stereotypes do to them and their families. So yeah. there's that. Um, I went to Catholic school for several years growing up. The first five years of my early education were all spent in Catholic school. Um, I switched to public school, late elementary school, and was just like, I was telling on people for swearing on the playground and like... <laughs> Really total Catholic kid in a public school environment and then very quickly was overtaken by the public school environment Mm. um, by middle school. And I really just spent my childhood, God bless my parents, my extended family. um, But there's just like a lot of brokenness in my family. And um, I did not know the faith growing up. We had the faith. We went to mass every week. Um, Really what I would consider to be like an outwardly pretty devout family. Sure. Um, my dad's side, my, we, my dad was anchored the faith for us. Um, but so I just, I had this very broken adolescence, like so many of us right. do, and especially those of us who grew up in that early technological boom where like no one knew about filters and things that you can do to protect your kids on the internet. So um, true. So that's kind of where I encountered a very sexualized culture um, and just really sifted through that a lot of that brokenness 
until a, a few years ago and mm-hmm. had like a reversion experience when I was about 21, came back to the church. Um, and I just was thinking yesterday, man, if you would have told me five, six <laughs> years ago that you were going to be like on fire for the faith, like that phrase would have bothered me so bad, like several sure. years ago. And now here I am with just like, it's just nothing but the grace of God that's worked mm-hmm. in my life. Like my entire life is just so full of grace that I just like cry about it now. If mm-hmm. I hear like the understanding that I have of the Lord now and what, what he's done in my life, what he's worked in my life. Um, it's to the point where like I was listening to Bishop Barron's joyful mysteries of the rosary yeah. following along the other day and his announcing of the mysteries. I was just like sobbing, like just the way that he spoke mm-hmm. about the like, God coming and dwelling in the ordinary. I just wouldn't have even understood what that meant five years ago. So, um, yeah, I'm just in this place now of like, I'm graduated. I have this great, just beautiful relationship. Um, it's like a May, December relationship. We have a pretty large age gap. Mm. Um, my, my partner and I, and we're planning marriage. I think I don't, I don't, I don't want to blow his surprise, but I'm pretty sure he's going to propose to me by Christmas. We think, (laughs) um, it's like we're so real about being married now. It's not like it's not going right. to come as a surprise or anything. But um, I was just deeply promiscuous several years ago and just really, mm. really broken sexually, really mm. broken, um, was just dealing with sexual assault and all sorts of oh, things. Gosh. And just I just find myself in this place of like, holy cow, like mm. healing is real. Freedom is real. It's available to me. Yeah. It's available to you. And I'm in that place yeah. of transitioning out of young womanhood into like mid twenties womanhood and like things like marriage and motherhood are on the horizon. And it's like, I wasn't always sure that I would even be alive to be mm. here. And my whole life is just one big amen now. Yeah. That's how I feel. Wow. So. Holy cow. He's Sorry. Like, I got deep no, too fast. I know you I didn't. That. No, you didn't. No, I loved, I loved every word you said because I, I talked to my husband after my first conversation with you and how I described you as whole. I was like, she's just very whole. Like, that's what I said. I was like, I loved talking to her because she's very whole. And so kind of before I get into follow-up questions, uh, Jordan and I wanted to do a disclaimer just because of the the topic. We're not sure what the title is going to (laughs) be currently. We're, We're not sure, but it'll probably be something that indicates that this episode is about um, LGBTQ identity and Catholicism or, um, you know, Catholicism reaching out to the queer community or just something, something that connotes that. Right. Um, and we just kind of want to go ahead and say, like, if you're looking for a doctrinal argument, this is not it. And, um, instead we want, we wanted to talk about exactly what Jordan just got is like the, the freedom that Jesus offers to each of us individually and, um, just the beauty of encountering him and just that he he doesn't have limits on encounter either he doesn't have the same he doesn't have the same boundaries we have like that's that's something I think about the Lord all the time is I'm like he doesn't like look at somebody and go like oh you're like a little too angry for me or like you're a little too this or you're a little too that like he, he just you know he's so you know relentless in how he pursues us and so I think I think your intro really got at that but um do you have any words on that on just kind of leaving leaving doctrine at the door we were saying Yeah, I think I'm just going to be real. It's boring. Like Mm. sitting, a lot of people are arguing doctrine all the time. Like there are, if you're looking for like apologetics and and that sort of like doctrinal, we're going to, I'm going to have a gay person on and we're going to like argue about gay and Jesus. Like I just (laughs) don't, that's, there's so much of that. And what I'm interested in is encounter. Like you're, here for an encounter with me. I'm here for an encounter with you. Yeah. And you know, it's, it is my prayer for people listening that no one leaves this feeling like more broken. Mm, um, yeah. I don't feel that like my identity is broken. I just don't, right, right. I just don't. And, um, I don't, I think that the church has so much beauty to offer mm. and there are things that the church teaches that are, that are what the church teaches that are really beautiful on this topic. And I just hope right. we we can like illuminate some of that for yeah, folks. Absolutely. I agree. I think, yeah. Cause a follow up question I had just kind of to your intro is like, so you talk about reversion and coming back to the faith and leaving behind sexual promiscuity. 
Um, but still like allowing your identity to be what it is. So how did you, coming back to the church, how did you find that journey of peace of like, okay, I'm going to leave this behind, but I'm going to allow the Lord to speak into this and help me embrace this. What did that look like? Does that question make sense? Yeah. So I think, I think it came in the presence of a person, a couple different people. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I've been in love solidly like twice in my life. Um, and I, both times, um, one was with a woman and one is with my current partner, uh, who is a man. And, Mm -hmm. um, I did not have an experience of like going to church and hearing something necessarily that like moved me. Mm -hmm. I had to have someone be put in front of me that loved me so hard that just, Mm -hmm. it like held a mirror up to me. Mm -hmm. And I had to, I had to completely break in order to be ready to accept Ned's love. Um, And that is not a commentary on my uh, former partner's love. I'm going to leave her name out because I did did not chat with her about being on this podcast. (laughs) Um, We're still very dear friends. Mm -hmm. Um, She's one of the greatest people I know. Yeah. Um, And I think it would be hard for people to hear, but like real love exists in queer relationships. Mm. You know, people want to beef doctrinally about how that should be expressed or what should or shouldn't be expressed. But there's real love between people. Right. Um, and whoever I bring up, it's not like a tacit endorsement or rejection of anything that they say. But someone that, who I have seen speak to this is Eve Tushnet. Yes. I hope I'm saying her name correctly. Yeah. And she's like, she's made that point too. Like there's love here and there's goodness about whatever your sexual identity is. So I had to, mm-hmm. first, I had to understand that. Um, but really the, the, out of the promiscuity that I was in – was not at all with women. Like the sure. woman that I was in love with, it was very much like a, there was intimacy and, and you know, it was very directed at each other. It was, but there was a time when I was just like sleeping with whoever and sure. um, just doing a, like just doing a lot of really lustful things and sure. seeking attention in, in very broken ways because uh, I had a broken understanding of what my body was for sure. and, what goodness was and Ned basically came along and I had like realized that I was falling in love with this guy and I just kept jacking him around, man. I just kept like, (laughs) you know, like playing games, just playing games and not being mature. And he's older than me. Right. So he was just like, not here for that. And, Mm. um, he literally had to tell me, um, you have to decide if you're going to be a big girl or not because, Mm the games that we're playing, like I'm in love with you. Like I'm mm-hmm. ready to pour my heart out for you and, and into your spirit and like just really build something with you. Mm-hmm. But if you're not ready for that, please don't play with me. Wow. And I had to call my mom and I like am so private with my mom and my family. There's just like a lot of mom stuff and mom yeah. wounds. But for the first time ever, I just like called my mom and was like, mom, I'm messing it up really bad with somebody really good. And wow. so that's how I feel like it was worked was like, I was not going to hear any beautiful talk by sister Miriam James Heidland. I was not going to hear any right. like really wonderful theologically articulated point. Like the Lord was like, here's somebody who's going to show you what you need in your life. Yeah. Um, and you're going to have to look at yourself really long and hard. Mm. And so that's that's what that change was like. It was very much like an embodied like person in front of me. Um, wow. And it, it wasn't easy. It, it wasn't like I just like had that grow up conversation with him. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to grow up now. Sure. Um, yeah. There had to be like a, a real like, this sounds kind of weird, but like if you've ever seen those videos where they're like blackhead removals, yeah. <laughs> like I, ha- I had to go in and like really root some stuff out sure. and yeah. I'm still doing that. You know, I'm still doing that. But, yeah, that's um, a lifelong process. And yeah. I, I love your point about um, just your former partner and um, her holding up the mirror to you. Like, I think that's what just good relationships across the board do. Like, and I think this is what you're getting at with there's so much good and so much love in those relationships is like um, sexuality and intimacy is like one part of a relationship or like sexual intimacy and in mm-hmm. sexual attraction it's one part and in real relationships it's a small part 
you know and so I, I think but those real relationships whether friendship romantic or other like they hold the mirror up to you they're like hey i'm st-, because something something about somebody saying like i'm sticking with you despite the fact that you're kind of shitty you know like you're yeah you're awesome though like beneath all of that you are awesome and yeah there's something about that but just i i love that yeah i just love that you were able to receive messages through people i think that's lovely um, yeah and I actually like the mirror thing I meant about Ned, like he oh, just like, yeah. but also of course she did too in many ways. Like I, she was in so many ways, she was ready for like serious, mature human relationship mm-hmm. on any level into yeah. like intimately and French. Like she was, she had done so much healing about herself. Like she was in divinity school and like really yeah. grounded and just like more mature than me on almost every level. Yeah. And I, I hurt her a lot by mm. just being like addicted to a whole bunch of different stuff, behaviors, substances, yeah. um, just just being flighty and unavailable to anybody. Mm. I was probably a really bad friend to like a lot of people. Yeah. But yeah. when it's someone who you're almost the closest with, um, yeah. you know, the amount of grace that she's had for me, like mm. just complete open armed forgiveness. Yeah. Wow. has been insane like yeah. insane and and I have not always felt deserving of it and I'm mm. she and I are now getting to a place where we can have real conversations that like we couldn't have before and um mm. just be like I was like the conversation is actually working two ways now because I am able to be yeah. vulnerable with people and I wasn't I really was not able to know what true vulnerability was Gosh. so Wow. Yeah. You would not be able to tell now. That's so beautiful. Holy cow. No. And yeah. I'm like, now I'm just like an open book with people for the most part. So, <laughs> which is lovely. So weird. Which is lovely. Um, so yeah, you moderate a small group for us. Um, but who I handed you like organized wise, it was just like women who obviously all of, all of the women who come to us, um, and who we have like the joy of accompanying. I mean, like I, I love, I love this topic so much, but just like, um, some women come with like solely addictions to masturbation. Some come with addiction to pornography and then some carry a burden of same sex attraction and to mm-hmm. them it is a burden. And yeah. so just kind of unpack that for us. Like, why is it tough to be queer and Catholic? And I say that question bluntly because sure. what's been tough about your experience and what do you yeah. see as tough in other people's experiences? So I, I think what's tough about it is so often everything gets whittled down to a doctrinal mm. understanding. Sure. And people are not doctrine. People are not walking acceptances or rejections of doctrine. Like we're really right. complex whole people. Even if we're broken, we're still, we're still, we have a whole human person. Um, and it's like with any other issue, whether it's people who drink people who have abused people, whatever, whatever people's cross is, whatever their journey is. Mm -hmm. And there are some people I got to put it out there. Like some queer folks do not consider their identity a cross, right? Like it's a joy for them. And um, sometimes for people it's both, but in other ways, I've heard this in homilies and things like that. We're able to see that that's not all that they are. Right. Yeah. Like you're an alcoholic, but you're not like, or you experience alcoholism, but you're not just a drunk. Like, that's not who you are as a person. Right. Or, you know, you are somebody who assaulted somebody, but you're not just an assailant. Right. Like, you, like there are, we're able to see the nuance about other types of people that we're just, it seems that we don't have about, um, like, queer and trans people in the church. And so it was really hard for me because I felt like if I revealed that part of myself to someone, mm. it was like putting a scarlet letter on myself. Like, there was no there was no longer anything else to my experience besides whatever weird image people had of what I might or might not be doing in the bedroom. Mm. Like, mm. that became my entire being. So I just didn't talk about it. And it just carrying two parts of yourself that way, like Mm -hmm. going to church and feeling like a fraud because I'm supposed to be revealing more than I have um, to people. It it was just, it was just hard to carry that without being able to talk to anybody Um, or having the only people that I was able to talk to be people who were not religious and God bless them because they were there for me. Absolutely. Um, 
but also it would have been great to have somebody in the church. And it's hard. It's also very, what's hard about being queer and Catholic and I'm, I'm not transgender, but like trans and Catholic as well is like going to church and having a priest or someone else assume that there are no people like you in the congregation Mm. and assume this sort of solidarity with who they may perceive to be a a whole, a room full of straight people. And then to talk and to talk really poorly about the community Mm. while there's, I know I'm not the only one here. There's like several hundred people in this cathedral right now. I can't be the only one who shares this identity And this priest just like referred to us as a problem or whatever. And it's like, now I don't feel welcome here. And now I don't know where I should go. And so Mm. I've, I've had beautiful, wonderful, holy priests preach about this in a way that brought me to the right kind of tears. Yeah. And I have, I have had the complete, I walked out of a mass for the first time in my life last summer Mm. over, over the way that a priest was addressing the issue and was just making people feel unsafe and really it's hard. So that's, what's hard is, is just this experience of marginalization, just straight up to name it. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, one of the tragic things that's happened is the conversation. Like I'm a big believer that politics should not have a place in homilies. Like, You can talk about issues that have a presence in the political sphere, but homilies should not be politicized. Like that's that's just where I stand. And maybe somebody wants to correct me on that and I'm open to being corrected. Um, But I found similar messages when abortion is talked about is like, why are we not starting first with like women in the congregation who are facing unwanted pregnancy or women in the congregation who have had abortions and like, do they know they're forgiven? Do they know they're loved? Do they know that there's mercy? You know, like they're, we don't Mm -hmm. start there. And I saw one priest, um, start there last summer where he just like opened up. He was like, I'm going to talk about abortion today, but before I begin, I want to talk about, um, or I I just want to tell you if you have had an abortion or participated in any way, like in an abortion, I want you to know how loved you are by God. Um, and that these pews are a place of forgiveness and not a place of shame and, you know, feel free Mm -hmm. to talk to me. And he just like, had the most moving beginning and then that made his homily much more powerful because everybody was like okay I'm loved by this man like I'm loved by my pastor no matter what I've done and I think like when we allow political um politically charged uh words or tension to come into homilies I I think that creates exactly what you just talked about people don't feel safe um because it's it's fine to preach about doctrine. That's what should be you know preached about in a way. But like it should be preached about in a way that makes people feel safe and makes people um, call into question behavior in a healthy way if that's needed. But like it it has to begin with like this is your pastor. This is your shepherd. You know this is like somebody mm-hmm. you're meant to see Jesus in. Like right. Not somebody who is supposed to be bringing like the ballot box to mass. You know like this is that's not what this is about. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just so terribly divisive, even to people who don't, who don't have any relation to the the super hot controversial topics. Like, sure. you know, people who are not trans or queer or who've had an abortion, right. like even for those folks who are trying to figure out how to love people well, who hear right. like really conflicting messages coming out of the world and their church. It's like, you should come to church and feel like what happened, like what is said there doesn't even fit out there necessarily like Mm. it should be so it should transcend all of that so much because that's what christ is and who christ is yeah that if i feel like i'm at a democratic party rally at a progressive church (laughs) or whatever yeah Yeah. and i feel like i'm at like a you know like conservative intellectual forum only like in a in a traditional latin mass church and i say that as somebody who like deeply loves the latin mass ditto um but i'm with you yeah but like if i feel like i'm at a political rally i'm in i don't know what's happening you know what i mean i should be getting what does christ have on this yes yeah i don't i know what the world has dude like i i know what they are offering me what what does christ offer me and can you break it down for me Right. And the way that's done isn't just by spitting doctrine again, or like people are like, oh, we're going to combat the lies of culture with truth. Right. But what, what brings that transcendent nature is not the truth. It's charity. 
It's like the truth yeah. is told in charity because that's not what culture does. Culture does not tell the truth in charity either. And so like no. if, if it becomes like a spitting war between the church and culture, like nobody gets anywhere, anywhere. Yeah. So when um, I'm in a church and a priest says something to the effect of the garbage of transgenderism. Oh boy. You know, like who, like, first of all, you're assuming that nobody there is trans could pause that or that they couldn't be hurt by what you're saying. Like yeah. if, if our, I don't know, there's just, I don't want to sound fluffy, but like, really, like we always talk about Christ being love and God being love. And like, love can be hard. Love can deliver hard messages. Yes. Love can deliver things that feel on um, disquieting, but to assume that there's not a parent of a trans person there who's really mm. struggling with how to love their child. Well, to assume that somebody doesn't have, um, a trans sibling or a neighbor who they're trying to figure out how to encounter and love well. Yeah. When what when what we get is basically like slander and and like character assassination. Um, it's just like, is this how we love each other? I no. just don't think so. No, or somebody who's recovered from gender dysphoria and has like compassion on that part of their life, which is like a huge yeah. part of healing is like not looking back on. Not looking like I don't look back on the season of my addiction with like what garbage my life was or something like that. Yeah. I actually I I bowed out of an interview for a documentary where the questions felt like they were asking me to admit that I felt like garbage all the time when I was addicted. I was like, no, I didn't. I had a beautiful life. I had a very beautiful life. Was it deeply affected by this? Yes, absolutely it was. But I had a beautiful mm-hmm. life and I don't I don't wish to go back into a place where I feel a lot of compassion for myself and I feel the mm-hmm. Lord's compassion for me. I don't I don't want to speak to 15-year-old Rachel like she was garbage. That's just not that's not who I want to be. And I think it's the same um with how um just people might look back on seasons of brokenness or sin. It's like we don't we don't need to encourage people to speak to their past selves or their present selves in a way that's condemning. It's just not it's not productive for healing it's not and it's not yeah it's not how christ sees you it's not how you actually were you were you've never been nor will you ever be garbage and yep um yeah that particular homily it was just one time but um it also it feels like sometimes as a church we're really fixated on a few issues and it's like those are all really hard things that should be discussed and they should be explored with compassion respect and sensitivity but if we're talking if like the gospel reading is, is about like, I don't know, well, the mustard seed. And somehow we're on like the problem of the gays. I'm like, <laughs> can you, can we go back for one second? Like, I just want to understand how we got here. And, you sure. know, I, I also always feel like a homily and I'm not out here to tell priests how to do their very oh, beautiful and yeah. holy job. But I always wonder like, there could be somebody in the congregation who hasn't been to church ever in five years yep. since they were a kid who is struggling with any number of things and is, is the experience that they had here of community and love. Is it one of love? And is it one that they're going to be like, you know what? Some of that was hard, but like, mm-hmm. I want to come back. Like, I, I don't know why, but I want, I just, I feel like I should come again Yeah, because I'm like a cradle Catholic who's firmly in the church. And I looked at my partner and was like, I've never done this. I have a deep and profound reverence and respect for the Eucharist and a devotion to the Eucharist, but I have to leave right now. Like I cannot, I cannot stay here. Mm -hmm. And I just know that if, if I am feeling that way as someone who is like on a some level able to go home, take some deep breaths, get into some prayer and regroup. Yeah. What's happening to folks who are just not at that point. Yeah. Are they just not coming back? Mm. So that's that's what I want. I want the I don't want to run away from uncomfortable, disquieting conversations, but like charity and grace. Yeah, you know. Are they disquieting in a way that is is loving and is welcoming yeah. at the same time? Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, I could like record five episodes with you and it wouldn't be enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's like tune in next week for how to do a homily featuring jordan no anyway um yeah no god bless all the priests if there are priests listening i am i know me deferential too. to you in many ways and do not dream of telling you how to deliver a homily well sure and like um, and everybody's you know everybody makes mistakes you know like who knows that priest who um 
who just hurt you deeply in his homily like who knows maybe he saw you walk out and had thoughts you know it was like wait a second maybe I didn't do that well you know like we yeah moments of like okay maybe I did not do that the way I should and you know and so he cool. gives me he gives me the Eucharist all the time at the Latin Mass and I always wonder like I wonder if he knows because that's like mm-hmm. the Eucharist at the Latin Mass is to me, it's, it's like so intimate. Like oh, you're on your so knees beautiful. in front of somebody yeah. and they're putting something in your mouth. They're putting like the Lord in your mouth. Mm-hmm. And you, you like, you kind of like are making eye contact with them and looking up at them. And it's uh, like, you yeah. know, yeah. it's hard for me to be in that position with this particular priest. So that mm-hmm. is like a, a thing for me. So wow. I know that if I'm feeling humility and just like grace yeah. and putting some things aside to like enter into this very spiritual act. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, you know, I shouldn't assume that he's not able to have humility and grace and growth and do the same. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. I love that. Um, okay. So another question that we had talked about is just, um, hitting on like marginalization and shame. So the, the common denominator, and I kind of want to give a disclaimer here again, is Mm -hmm. I like that you pointed out that not, not every woman who comes to us sees same sex attraction as a burden right? Mm -hmm. And that's why our language around it is different where I've asked women before, I'm like, is this something you want help recovering from? Or is this something you want to become at peace with, you know? And it's like, the choice is yours. Like if, if you want to strive to, um, to not have this as a part of your life because you see it as a negative effect of a pornography addiction, that's fine. And, you know, your healing is, in, you know, largely up to your own determination and what you're willing mm-hmm. to put in the work. But if this is something about yourself that you have held for a long time and you sought out other things, trying to make peace with it, maybe here is where you finally can in a way that's healthy. Mm-hmm. And so I think um, I'd love to talk about just like the the marginalization and shame that women who are sexually addicted or and or just have fallen into sexual sin and the lgbt community have Mm -hmm. in common um just kind of in the church and just like not feeling like there's voices fighting for them not feeling like there's uh, much conversation or even just dismissal there's a lot there's been a lot of dismissal i think we are i think we are getting better i think we are reaching a place of improvement on both sides Mm -hmm. um but i would just love for you to speak into that like what you know I guess, what is that experience like and what can the church do differently to change this for both, for both camps? So shame is insidious because sometimes it's just become so present and it's so, it's just so there about something that you just forget that it's there. Like, it's just not, you're so used to walking around in a state of shame. And I think that, Mm. I think as someone who has experienced um, just really broken sexual expressions. And by mm-hmm. this, I'm, I'm really just talking about just the, the sex that I was ha- like, just premarital, like really sleeping with a lot of men, giving my heart to men who definitely didn't deserve it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then all the st- pornography, all of this, there was such a shame there, but it was just like a part of my life. Yeah. Like I did, I wouldn't even have been able to tell you I'm carrying shame And I definitely much less, I wouldn't have been able to tell you about what. Mm. And I, I watched The Chosen. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. Don't make me cry. I love that show. You know the episode I'm about to shoot for right here. Oh no. Nicodemus comes and talks to Mary Magdalene. And um, she recalls to Nicodemus and says, I was one way. Mm. and now I'm different and the thing that happened in between was him she also tells Nicodemus he called me Mary called Mm. me by my name and for the church like what what the church could do differently is I I think we could find a way to remind women everybody anybody Mm. that Jesus comes with just the ability to break open and break down everything that feels hard yeah. and that he will call you by your name. Mm. He's not going to call you by your shame or your brokenness or whatever feels like crap. Yeah. He is going to come and demand that you look him in the face and then he's going to call you by your name. Mm. And just if 
just if the church could just get into that, man, if we could just help people to remember that they are known intimately and deeply that, yeah. um, and I was listening to a talk by sister Miriam. Um, mm. she was on, she was on Pines of Aquinas and I was watching. Oh, lovely episode. Yeah. Good Lord. And she said, she said, um, I think this, yeah, she was talking about Genesis and the Lord walking in the garden and saying, where are you? Mm. And that just really got me yesterday when I was listening to that. Yeah. Like he was asking like, which, maybe which tree are you behind? Right. But also like, where are you? Like, where are you? And that shows, and if we could in our imperfect way, try to imitate God's searching for us mm -hmm. and desire to have us be a part of his body and a, and a member of his beautiful and glorious church in all of its mm. brokenness and beauty and all of it. I never felt like the church sought me. Like I didn't feel like mm. if I had shame, they would even have a clue of what to do with it or what to say to me or what to remind me of. Like, and especially as women, and you've talked about this and this is like where Magdala gets at is there wasn't a space for me as a woman um, and even less as a queer woman to be like, here's what I'm carrying. Yeah. yeah. They, I don't think, and I think a lot of really beautiful, wonderful people, priests, sisters, work for the church and they are trying to figure out how to reach us. And I think, like you said, I think it's, I think it is getting better. Um, mm. But yeah, I just didn't feel like the church had the words for me. Mm. And now I know that really it does, but I had to yeah. really go looking for it on my own. Um, mm. And it was a really hard walk. Yeah. Yeah. I experienced like something similar. I think, obviously like different different reasons but and I, I've had the question so many times of do I fit here like is are there women like me in the Catholic Church mm -hmm. um can I belong as a in it can be the smallest thing even like I have a very choleric temperament I have, I have a very go-getter personality a very strong opinionated personality and sometimes the women I've been surrounded by at different points in my life are not like that you know, it can be something as small as that where I'm like, is there, is there a space for me where I want to work and be a mother at the same time? Is there a space for somebody who, um, has opinions on theology and philosophy and voices them extremely readily and yeah. doesn't wait to be told, you know, is, is there a place for that? Um, and I, th I think that's a question at the bottom of every human heart, whether, you know, queer or a sex addict or, you know, a convert of any sort, you know, or just, just that's at the bottom of the human heart is, is there a place for me anywhere? You know, can, is there a place where I can bring my unique experiences, my unique brokenness, my complexities? Mm -hmm. Um, because outside of myself, you know, everybody looks the same. Everybody feels the same. And I've, I felt that many moments in my life where it's like, everybody feels like they have something I don't, or feels like they're tuned into something I'm not tuned into. Mostly mm -hmm. it's, I think with other women, I felt like every single woman gets this gentleness and this femininity that I did not have bestowed on me. That was like mm -hmm. a lie I had to let go of many times in my life. Um, but I think the, yeah, the church, I love that you, you talked about the chosen, but just the church learning to call people by their name and go below. Like, I don't care if you agree with me doctrinally or not. You are a person. You are a daughter of God. You are, yes. you are a child of God. Like, you know, I want, I want to hear about your life. I want to hear about your experiences and I'm not going to correct you. Mike, I think that's the thing that I have found in conversations. Um, yeah, just with people who are experiencing a lot of hurt or marginalization from the church is like, can we start, can we start with just not correcting people? Like maybe, can we just start with listening that I, I found like, and I've corrected people too many times in my life, but it's like, when I start with just listening of like, okay, tell me, tell me about what hurt you you know, tell me about what hurt you. And I, um, I had an experience last summer where I worked at a restaurant with, um, I was a hostess and the two other, um, hosts and hostess were, um, they were both, one was bisexual and one was gay. And, um, they both had grown up in more of a Baptist kind of faith, um, like Southern Baptist. And they were talking to me about just brutal experiences they've had with their pastors yeah. and just openly sharing that. Um, and I just looked at them and the first thing I said was like, I, I am so sorry that you were treated that way. I am so sorry that you were treated that way. Like, that's horrid. 
Um, and they were like, you know, well, are you Christian? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm a devout Roman Catholic. And I even said <laughs> something about, I was like, I completely agree with the church and doctrine. Um, but I don't think this is a discussion about your lifestyle. Like I, it shouldn't matter if I agree with lifestyle or not. Like I, I am sorry that you were treated that way in Christ church. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And one of them like received that really well. And the other like reported me for harassment. <laughs> like it was, oh, no. but, yeah. And I, and just kind of, I was very hurt by that. And I talked to the other person about it and was like, you know, I got reported and why do you think that was? And she was like, he probably just wasn't ready. It wasn't you, yeah. he probably just wasn't ready. And I thought that was the most like mature and merciful thing she could have said was like, some people are so in pain and like have believed their pain, have believed what their pain tells them that they're not ready for a conversation. It's gotten that bad. And I think that also has to be acknowledged is like, we have to be so gentle also because there is so much charge around these conversations. It's like, you have to start so simple and so gentle. It's, it's like the church is made up of a bunch of wounded, broken people yep. who, unless we cling hard to the love of Christ and beg for the grace of the Lord upon our lives every yeah. day, we're just going to be like running around, bumping into each other, or like <laughs> just like bruising each other all the time. It's just like a bunch of, and this is how I feel about adults in general. Yeah. We're just like a bunch of broken kids yeah. who grew up into adults who never dealt with their stuff and like, yeah. We're just out here hurting each other. And yeah. it's like, there's so much pain. And it's it's hard to see a wounded church interact with its wounded members. Mm. Because it's like, if I can sometimes step out of my relation to both of those groups, because we are the church and we're also its members and right. all of that. We're a part of the problem. Yeah. It's, sure. Yeah, we yeah, for sure. And I and I, I mean, when I'm able to step out and look at it, I'm just like, this is so sad. <laughs> this know. is so sad. Can we just like love on each other for a minute and not to be fluffy or hippie about it? But like, could we just really evaluate what it means to encounter mm-hmm. each other? Yeah. What encounter? First of all, encounter is a thing. Secondly, like you said, let's listen first. Like, yeah, maybe maybe not trying to change somebody, maybe beginning with encounter and listening that would go so far for so many people I know who've been warned, wounded by the church in one way or another. Right. I know people who are just like, I don't even understand why you feel attached to this. Like, mm-hmm. I don't, yeah. you know, like they were abused by clergy or they were abused by their parents who were like really devout Catholics mm-hmm. and they don't understand how such a beautiful church could produce two such broken people. But it's yeah. all, all of this all of this brokenness, if we could just like really lean into the word encounter and yeah. it's assuming that this person has something to offer that I could learn from. Mm. Whether you are a Roman Catholic priest of 55 years or a 17 year old who thinks that there's absolutely nothing that you could ever possibly in any way learn from a Roman Catholic priest. Like, yeah. <laughs> could we try to encounter each other as though a we're all coming here for a good faith discussion yeah. And a good faith, whatever we're doing, prayer, yes. mass. And could we then be ready to learn from whatever that discussion? Yes. Whatever the fruits are here, like, what can we learn? Yeah. Mm. And and I think that that's the way it is in the world right now, too. Like, everybody is assuming that everybody else is coming with, like, big spiked maces in their hand yeah. and, like, <laughs> and, like, you know, like, rifles. And I'm like, I'm actually just here for, like, a real good open heart conversation. Right. And, you know, I'm in an I'm in an organization that's having some internal troubles right now. Mm -hmm. And I just noticed I'm sort of I'm a neutral party. I was not involved in the conflict between some members. And I was like, you know, the way that we're even asking these questions assumes that the other person has like real malice in their heart. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could set that aside. Would we be having a different conversation? Yeah. Yeah. Mm, That's powerful. I think that is like the setting aside is so crucial. Because even for me, yeah. like, I, I, yeah, I was, like, apologetics queen in high school. Like, I loved mm-hmm. apologetics. I was fascinated by it and got two degrees in theology from a very conservative Catholic school, which I loved. And I don't, I, I identify very heavily with, like, that part of the tradition. Um, but I have, I have had to learn over and over throughout my life to set aside this false notion that I have a monopoly on the truth, you know, like, I have a monopoly on the truth and it is my job to deliver it as quickly as possible. 
It's mm-hmm. like, no, it's your job to deliver it as effectively as possible. I'm supposed to be a good steward of what I've learned. Um, but like just spitting it out at any random opportunity is not being a good steward. Like it, it's not. Mm-hmm. And people and- people come to the church through encounter. That's that is what brings people to Jesus. It's not somebody, you know, who is street evangel street evangelizing spat things mm-hmm. out of me. I'm not saying anything directly against street evangelization. I think it has its place. But you know <laughs> what I mean? Like there I think yeah, I, I think I've just had to learn so many times that like just because I, I have been blessed to study um, to the depth that I have and to set a course for myself to be a lifelong student of theology um, doesn't mean that that like that gives me the right to just spit it out at every given opportunity, every given opportunity, nor to believe I have just a prowess over it. I think that's been but that can be a person who's not a student of theology that can just be any Catholic. We, we like to believe we have a monopoly on the truth. And I think also like we always forget that like a few years ago or 10 years ago, whenever it was, we did not have all the information that we have now. Yep. And then we want to like clap back at people or like, like you said, give that like very quick and decisive <laughs> delivery of our understanding of truth. Right. Yeah. Without pausing to remember, like, first of all, how long have we had this truth? Have we sat with it? Have we explored it within ourselves? Have we figured out how we're working with this truth? Are like before we go it? Yeah. spitting it to other people. And also I always, you know, as I have become, I guess the only phrase for it is like more Catholic. Like I was <laughs> not this, I was not this religious and I would never have called myself religious. And now I do. Yeah. Um, I try to look at how Christ delivered teachings mm. and, and, you know, all we can ever do is try to imitate, right? But right. like, he, there were times when he said, but "Like, but like, let those who can accept this accept it." Or he just he would he would lay something down to his disciples and those who were listening when they were ready. Right. And, and you see, you see prophets doing this throughout. You know, our our his, the history of our tradition and the Jewish tradition. Like, there were just some times when the people were not ready mm-hmm. to hear what was what could be offered. Yeah. Um, and, and God's divine timing makes things known to people when they, when they're ready for it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that was just my, my two cents on that. Like some people are just, we're just not in a place where we can have a conversation. I mean, sometimes the intelligent thing and the wise thing is to say, actually, maybe this conversation is not possible with this person at this time. And that's okay. And, and yeah, strive that's- to make it possible. But no, I think that's, that's mature because yeah, I mean, even the apostles, like, scripture is very clear. Like, these are the men who journeyed as closely with the person of Christ, like, as possible. Um, mm-hmm. And there are so many things that they did not understand. Like, especially Mark's gospel notes that, how, like, they didn't they didn't understand anything. And yeah. um, they witnessed miracles and didn't understand them, you know? And so mm-hmm. it's okay for people who are walking very closely with Jesus to just not understand yet and to be unpacking something and to be questioning mm-hmm. and kind of ruminating on something and learning how to apply it. Um, my husband and I talk regularly about like cancel culture <laughs> and yeah. I'm make this really, but just, and how cancel culture has invaded the church. We, we talk regularly about that. I think we talked a couple days ago was our last installment in this conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, but just talking about like how we are so quick to dismiss people on one, one thing just just one it, it takes one bad instance of like or just something we disagree with like I was teaching an adult formation class at a parish over the summer and I mentioned something about Bishop Barron and I, I really like Bishop Barron do I agree with every single word Bishop Barron says no I love Bishop Barron yeah but yeah I love the guy yeah and I think he's done incredible work um My and gosh. just has such a beautiful heart and a, a just yeah such intelligent delivery I, I love him Um, but I don't have to agree with everything he does, but like this person brought up in class, they were like, well, you know, he said that he, you know, he did the dare we hope thing, like the universal salvation thing. I'm like, okay, well, so did Hans Urs von Balthasar. Like he's the one who popularized it. And he was like made a cardinal before he died, you know? And I took that opportunity to just kind of talk to the students in the class about like, you know, are you canceling Bishop Barron because of one thing you disagree with? Because like Thomas Aquinas didn't believe in the Immaculate Conception, yo, like, you know, this, we, we can't, we can't like write people off based on one thing that we disagree with because we never know where they're going to be in a year. We, we never know where we're going to be in a year, you know, or 10 years or 15 or whatever. Like yeah. just give people time and space to 
come to an understanding. We are all coming to understanding on different things. And no theologian, no Catholic, no nothing, like no saint has ever gotten everything 100% right. It's impossible. Right. Right. Unless you're, unless you're Jesus or the Blessed Mother. But that's so good. I mean, yeah, I've been like doing without, I, I've been like really changing the way I interact with like social media and stuff. And Mm. it's been glorious. Oh, shoot. um, I love it. I mean, cancel, um, which ties back to what you were saying just a few minutes ago about cancel culture. Yeah. It's like, I think going to like a secular, like liberal arts school Mm. in so many ways exposed me to so much. And that's great because I know so much about different worldviews and perspectives and cultures and peoples and stuff. But also the idea that if I don't agree with you on every single thing, (laughs) not only can I never talk to you again. I must like defame your character on the internet <laughs> and you're probably a super raging sexist, racist, patriarchy upholding monster yeah. that I cannot be in the same room with. And that's just like, and and I actually, it's so funny because I felt that way about Bishop Barron like a long time ago. <laughs> I was like, Ugh, who is this like dry philosophical guy? And now I'm like, bishop Barron, crazy i'm just yeah. like give me all the bishop Barron, Love like him. yeah just the beauty of the resources the word on fire institute puts out um and i just i'm reading the newer book that he just wrote light uh light from light oh i've and heard amazing things it's really really good um yeah. yeah it's wonderful i just i love the creed i love that we have a creed but um creeds are creeds are good creeds yeah are very good all right if you want good stuff on the creed do uh ratzinger's introduction to christianity too whoa because it is has some heavy heavy creed stuff and it's he's awesome. another dude that i was like super ready to cancel and now i'm like whoa um he's actually a beautiful human yeah like, benedict the 16th ugh, love him of like and also just like evaluating why i didn't have a, a a really super solid tie to the church when i was younger is like just gonna shoot from the hip here like i went to a pretty irreverent novus ordo mass like my whole life mm. did, did i i did not have a sense of the beauty of the church and like wow. liturgy like like real and god bless everybody who it feels attached to like sure super and i'm not being like i'm trying i'm not being disrespectful like it really sounded like campfire music to me like mm. it and it's music that some of the hymns that we sang like i would actually like throw them on in my car to do like praise and worship right like it's not like the music is just like bad and i hate it like right it's just like, I don't know if like time and place, you know what I mean? Like I'm not, so right. that's, a, that's like you said, conversation for a different day. But um, when I look back at like some of the things that Pope Benedict XVI wrote about liturgy and the beauty of, of tradition yeah. um, and then Samorum Pontificum, I was just like, um, oh snap, like <laughs> I love you. I love you. I'm really sorry. I'm really yeah. sorry that I like dismissed like the vicar of Christ over like a few right. things that were taken out of context in the media. Like, uh, yes, yeah. still happens to this day for sure. I think that's, yeah, that's a, a, it. That is the biggest example of cancel culture. Is like we're we're putting a lot of pressure on our popes. We have for the past several decades. I'm not just talking about Francis, um, but just just like. Again, I think Encounter allows for this. And ironically, Francis is the one who is like push, push, push Encounter. And I really love that. Um, But yeah, ironically, like we forget that popes are people. um, And we put a lot of pressure on them to be Jesus. And we also don't give ourselves permission to be saddened and disappointed by some actions of our pope. um, And also praise other ones that we agree with. We, We feel like it either has to be like black or white. It's like either right. I hate him or I love him to death. And it's like, okay, it can also be neither. He, he can be another human to you who you obey out of reverence and, you know, respect for the church um, yeah. and reverence for its tradition. But y- you you are allowed to be very saddened by some of his decisions, but you're also allowed, you're allowed to not not be mad about everything he does. You're allowed to do that. That's the that's thing you, are, you, yeah. have, you have permission to do. Um and that's that's what I've found is I'm like I've just I've never found comfort in um in just like canceling our current pope I've I have never found comfort in it but I've never found comfort in like defending him you know either of like oh no he's always doing great things it's like no he's not he, he's a human 
he's a human and Mm -hmm. um but i think we we don't give ourselves permission to feel what we feel um on in both respects we don't give ourselves permission to feel really 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 disappointed like deeply heartbroken even by some of the things that have happened but gosh like i've said some things before i'm like i really liked when pope francis said that and like people just turn and like glare at me and i'm like this is our pope guys like we have to feel like he can do something right i mean like this is this is like a lot this is a lot yeah and i i actually this is so funny i did not know i had seen it suggested lots of times but i know people are gonna have like audience gasp i did not (laughs) know about pints with aquinas until i found your podcast oh wow so so like congratulations you were like the door into pints of aquinas world Thanks. For me I, I really hope i love that i have led you into a world that you love because I, um yeah yeah <laughs> and again like matt fred is somebody that i do not agree with all the time yeah but i find him deeply engaging so and lovely i human yeah there's just the the like breadth of like people that he has on it's just i've learned so yeah. much from like and his interviews are so long and stuff and he had an episode and i forget who it was with but they were talking about Pope Francis and mm-hmm. how like there are people who will not refer to him as like, you know, Pope, <laughs> like, the, right. you know, yeah. or, you know, and, and Matt was like, I, look, I, you know, I got some feelings, but I, he was referring to him as the Holy Father, like just this respect and yeah, absolutely, um, just being able to understand that like, and this is my words, not his now, but um, like we all, and this goes to the queer and trans thing as well. Like, not denying someone's capacity for goodness Mm. and like why is it that someone doing something that we do all the time which is to have some sort of expression out into the world of like sin brokenness mistake making like whatever it is yeah and you get to write somebody off for that Mm. in a way that you would never want somebody to treat you like it just seems so kindergarten right but like treat others how you'd like to be treated. Like, would I, in a very public role, in a very heavy role that is like the chair of St. Peter, would I, would I just want people to like look at something and disagree with something and just like discard me? Mm -hmm. I don't like feeling discarded. Yeah. So I shouldn't like just throw people away. Right. I I don't know. That's so, sorry. We like veered way off. I hope that's okay, but. Oh no, it's totally okay. This is what podcasts are for, are veering, you know? it's yeah. the, this is what we do I think yeah I'm glad you brought Matt up because this was something so moving for me when I did that interview on Pines there was there were several times where I think this was part of why I was able to converse with him easily also because we had had many conversations prior but like I there were several times where I looked at him and he was like teary-eyed while I was yeah. talking like he's so not he, he is truly encountering like and I think mm-hmm. that's why his discussions with people are so fruitful is because he's not there to perform he's not there to i mean he is there to deliver good content to faithful people who are looking for it um that's his job but he truly listens to his guests i sense that yeah Yeah. he he is like records them on video so you can see him like really encountering people yeah and i i think that's just like that was inspiring for me to see and just see as an example of how to do ministry and how to do conversation. It's like, okay, I, I shouldn't care. Like right now we shouldn't care. Okay. How many people are going to listen to this podcast? Are we going to call it? It's like, okay, no, I'm here talking to you, Jordan. And like, Mm -hmm. maybe I'm not moved to tears by what you're saying. Although I was when you referenced the chosen, (laughs) I was like, (laughs) but like, I just, uh, so beautiful. Um, but like, I, you know, we should be here speaking to each other and, and not caring so much. And, so encounter in the culture of encounter is it needs to be built um so far beyond just you know queer catholics and trans catholics and sexually yeah. addicted women and like this is this is something we're all lacking but we're all longing for we're all longing for it um but kind of moving into catechism stuff that we had wanted to talk about i love how long this has gone already this, i like knew i was like this one's not going to be short um <laughs> so well actually no Prior to catechism, what I want to do is the next bullet point. Um, So what are some of the lies that shame, so whether over identity or if you want to speak into sexual addiction, um, what were some of the lies that shame tells us or has told you even from your own experience about the love of God? Like what has shame, 
like, what have you believed because of shame? Oh man, shame, shame tells you that God's love is conditional mm-hmm. and that, that there is actually something that you could do mm-hmm. that would separate you from the love of God. Mm-hmm. And I think shame is doing what Adam and Eve did is putting leaves and Mm. covering up the parts of ourself that now that we're aware of them, we feel must be hidden. Cause Mm. really for me, I don't think it was that I was afraid of God seeing them because I knew I can't hide anything from God. I was afraid that I would see. I was afraid that Mm. I had to look down at myself and that was just too much. And so shame, shame. I just think shame is like the most, potent proof of the devil Mm. is like shame feels like something that you created. It doesn't feel like something that the devil created. Right. Yeah. It, it feels like something you've done inside yourself. Like you've stirred up this shame. You've created this thing around yourself and it can feel very protecting, um, and secure because admitting to yourself that even in all this brokenness, you're still worth God's love. Mm. is way harder than just hating yourself. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. And another lie I think is like, I I think shame once you, the hardest part for me was, is, is still coming out of shame, right? Like I'm stepping into some freedom and, um, I think shame's like sidekick is like scrupulosity too. Mm. Like now that I'm, now that I'm kicking shame, which is like awesome. Like I'm like, yay, unburdening myself, going to mm-hmm. confession for the first time in a long time. Praise Jesus. You know, this, this past like two years, I've been back in confession. And now, even though I'm like doing better things for myself, like I'm putting myself under a microscope mm. um, in relation to my sin that I've like never done in my life. Wow. Um, so I don't know if that's not, I guess that's probably not a lie that shame itself told me but like no just, I, I think that's accurate because I think it comes as part of the shame journey yeah. of like loosening shame is like yeah. there will be other things <laughs> that slide in there and it's right it's, that all feels connected I guess I would agree with that I think that's yeah I think it's very succinct because it's like yeah and I, sh- I struggled very heavily with with scrupulosity at one point in my life and still often on do on certain things but I found it particularly with sexuality coming out of struggling with pornography um i was extremely scrupulous with chastity with sexuality with purity with all of these things um and because i think what scrupulosity does is it gives you a semblance of control it's like i know i hurt myself i know i hurt other people i know i hurt god through my behavior um in the past and i know i was not living as i ought to and i'm going to stop myself from ever doing it again obviously that's just not accurate like that's just not possible right um instead you should be leaning on you know jesus and the life of grace right but um but yeah i think scrupulosity gives you the idea that you can you can stop the pain that you caused yourself you know if you're just if you're just thinking about it enough and worrying about enough you can stop yourself from going back um so scrupulosity i think is also linked to pride but shame and pride are also linked they are definitely in the same because you should you should never be surprised that like you've fallen. You should be surprised that you didn't fall further. You know, I think yeah. that was, was that St. Therese? I feel like it was maybe, maybe it's Jacques Philippe. I don't know. Have you, have you read Father Jacques Philippe? I, I have not. Oh, bro. Searching for and maintaining peace is like, it, yeah, I think it's like the penultimate like spiritual book. So just, wow. <laughs> just read it. It's amazing. But, but he talks about that, just making peace with your brokenness and your sin. And, um, okay. Now we can, yeah, now we can talk catechism um yeah but i think it's important that our conversation about the catechism leans on what we just talked about is like nothing separates you from the love of god right Mm -hmm. scripture says that and even when we talk about mortal sin right and this is where like doctrine kind of doesn't we we have to go deeper than doctrine it's like mortal sin separates us from the life of grace it severs the life of grace in us but it does not make god stop loving us and i think people think sometimes that it does like Mm -hmm. That if I'm in mortal sin, God no longer has his gaze upon me. He no longer loves me. And that's literally impossible. If God no longer had his gaze upon you, you would cease to exist. Like, Mm -hmm. that's the fact of the matter. So it severs you from the life of grace because you chose that. And so God in his justice allows you to distance yourself from him. But he never stops loving you. 
And I think our conversation about just what the catechism has to say about homosexuality and how to encounter homosexual persons, like I, th- I think we we have to lean on that. The nothing separates you from the love of God. And if we believe yeah. that, then it makes this conversation make sense. So anyway, um, so catechism of the Catholic Church, 2358 says, the number of men and women who have deep-seated homosexual tendencies is not negligible. This inclination, which is objectively disordered, constitutes for most of them a trial. They must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. These persons are called to fulfill God's will in their lives, and if they are Christians, to unite to the sacrifice of the Lord's cross, the difficulties they may encounter from their condition. So begin unpacking that for us. Just so, thoughts. Here's the thing that I should just get out front with, right? <laughs> That's just a hard teaching. Mm -hmm. It's just Mm -hmm. a hard teaching. And especially like, it's one that I'm not, it's hard for me. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend like I'm in this place where I'm just like, yes, I just like feel the grace of that teaching now. Like I, sometimes I just don't like, I just don't just the the idea that um, any of us are able to like read everything in the catechism and be like, yes, like (laughs) it's just, it's, it's a really like, ball of wax hard thing for especially people who are um queer and especially for those of us who don't feel it's a burden to be queer sure um that's a tough teaching the second thing i'll say is you should always try to encounter tough teachings figure Mm. out what you can learn from them um and the other thing is i cannot tell you the amount of times in my life that i have heard that I am intrinsically or objectively disordered. Mm. Oh my I can tell you how many times I've heard about respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Right. Just about zero. Right. Just about zero. So it's a problem for me that LGBTQ Catholics know very well how the church or how people are saying the church views us. Yeah. Or, um, how we ought to order our lives and our behaviors Mm -hmm. according to that bit of the catechism. But how many straight Catholics know what their responsibility to that passage is? Mm, Amen. Cause that is what really, really grinds my gears. Yeah. Like, okay, you've delivered that to me approximately 11,000 times. Mm-hmm. I'm working on whatever that holds for me, okay? Like, I really, truly am. Yeah. Are you working on holding me in respect, compassion, and sensitivity? Mm. If you don't even know that that's part of what 2358 says, yep. then we're in a dark place. Mm. We're in a dark place because that when I read that for the first time, I, like, literally wept because I felt so failed And I also felt very freed because I felt like the only teaching the church had for me and for others was these people are just sick. Like there's just something way off. And, um, you know, again, let's hold disagreement and like, hmm, okay. At the same time, I know people have a lot of feelings about father Jim Martin. However, (laughs) his book the opening page of that book um, was Psalm 139. Right. And I was like, dude, what? Like, what are you saying to me right now? And then he just like plugged the catechism teaching in there and I got to read it in full for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I I was on my floor, on the floor of Barnes and Noble, sobbing my eyes out. And that Mm -hmm. was the beginning of my reversion to the church. Wow. So people can say what they want about the guy. He said some stuff that I disagree with. No, but you can't. But, I, I, I think looking at the man, like his intention is clear. I think his, his intention, intention is, is very clear. Yeah. And if you read his book. I, I, I didn't find know. his book that charged up. I was like, I agree with a lot of this. Like, I was going to say, like, if you actually read his writing. It's very pastoral. And yeah, people think it's like full of hot takes about like what we should be changing about church teaching. And he like doesn't offer that. That's on his Twitter. He, it's like it's mostly on people's Twitters. Like it's it books you know you're not gonna find it there but no i i agree like his i think his um yeah i found his book to be very pastoral and very and it was 
medicine for me. Yeah. Like, and that's important. It, it was medicine. It was like, I was in a dark place of just really, um, wanting so badly to find a spiritual tradition that just mm -hmm. didn't make me feel like crap. Yeah. And I had just wandered through all sorts of like Eastern, uh, philosophies and, you know, Buddhism and no joke. I was like a Hare Krishna for a brief time. There you go. Um, so <laughs> I love it. It, it, that was just like a really <laughs> weird phase of life for me. Um, but what was definitely true was that when I read that book, I knew for the first time in forever that like, I have a place in this church. Yeah. Wow. That's so sorry about the door slam. Um, <laughs> the church, like I belong to the church and in some sense the church belongs to me because like mm. it's my birth. Group. It is my baptismal right yeah. to come to this place and seek all the medicine that my soul needs and, and to like, do my part in mm. in my own salvation basically um and man i'm telling you like the religion section at barnes and noble that carpet <laughs> that carpet is like hallowed ground for me now when i go there i'm like yeah this is where it all happened like um... yeah his book just it just it first of all i don't think i'd ever read psalm 139 mm. so that was just like whoa um and then secondly just like understanding that there was a Roman Catholic priest who not only like didn't hate gay people, but that cared enough and loved us enough to write a book mm. and to put himself out there into a position that was sure to receive lots of hate and criticism sure, and to try to reach us with love and compassion and respect and sensitivity, just like just brought me to my knees literally. Mm. And um, so He's a very dear person to our community, those of us who are journeying with the church because I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. He's very dear to us. So that there was that, you know, and that that was the first time I had ever encountered the respect, compassion, and sensitivity teaching. Mm. Um And what would you say that looks like now? Like beyond Father James Martin, which I, I think it's I think it's important for people who maybe disagree with him as i do on many things but like it's important for people to hear the good work that he has done um because again it's that it speaks to that canceling thing of like we cancel so easily over this topic it's like okay don't write off the fact that like father james martin was ordained a priest for a reason like it was in god's design and that part of his pastoral work has been to a community that has felt so broken and so left alone um and like yeah maybe has he gotten into hot water over that sure but it doesn't change moments like your barnes yeah. and noble moment i think that's powerful to hear but like yeah. what does beyond beyond him what is what does compassion and respect and sensitivity look like what are some examples of what you've seen and the behaviors that you wish people would imitate so um my parish priest uh he's my favorite human mm. and i also love my partner ned he's also my favorite human uh, but <laughs> Yeah, this priest, he's just, he told me once, I think the church has important things to say on human sexuality and um, abortion and childbearing and things like that. But we also have other things to talk about. Yes. And mm -hmm. so just hearing like preaching that is diverse in content and not like laser focusing in on the like women who've had abortions and the gays. Yes. Like, yeah. It was, like, it just makes us feel like we're also here to learn about stuff with everybody else. That and like, pray with, yeah. yeah, just like to be, you know, and not feel targeted. feels great. Mm. Um, and he did mention one time in a homily. It's the only time he ever mentioned anything having to do with it. I think that I've heard. He just said, I just want you all to know this is the table of the Lord. Like it is my greatest joy to invite everybody who is in a state of brokenness and who is just like really like just wondering if they belong in a mm. Roman Catholic church. Welcome. Mm. Like, welcome. I love you. Wow. I love that you're here. I praise God for the good work that he did by putting you in a pew in this church that I have the pleasure of leading. And I don't care if you are black or white or gay or straight or whoever, you're a child of God. And I love you. Mm. And people were sobbing. Like people needed that so badly. 
And so that's what it can look like. It doesn't always have to even really, it doesn't have to do necessarily with like that part of my identity per se. Mm. But if you treat me like I'm as loved as everybody else anyway, not knowing anything about me, that's that teaching too, Mm. right? Like that teaching goes far beyond, you know, uh, lesbians and and gays and, and trans folks. It's, it's a matter of like, do I feel, do I feel like I'm one of your flock? Yeah. Right. Am I like, a human? Oh, like, it, am I a person? Yeah. Man? Like, yeah. It seems pretty basic, but like we are there in some ways. And I think, I think it is getting better. Like I, I, I actually do have deep hope for the church on this. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe, maybe that's always been there. I just didn't know the right people. Um, this conversation is like a big old glimmer of hope to me. And, mm-hmm. um, I'm being mentored by a religious sister in this area. And I told her really raw and honestly. And I think that's like di- the kind of conversation that I'm able to have with like a woman sure. religious is just different than my wonderful parish priest. Um, and she just like teared up. Like she just was like so in horror by some of the things that I told her and like really accompanied me yeah. um, past me on my journey. And she was just like, and we were on Zoom because she's she's older and, you know, COVID. Mm. She was like, I just want to hug you. Like, I just want to tell you how loved you are. Mm. Like, and, and so those kinds of experiences happening were outside of what I would have expected from anybody who would have called themselves Catholic. And yeah. I know that there might be some, like, queer and trans people listening who just feel, like, interested enough to listen but too scared to come to church. And it's, like, For sure. heard. Totally heard. Yes. Also you'd be surprised. Mm, Yeah. You'd be surprised. Yeah. And I think the, I think the difficulty on both sides, um, is like for straight or not, you know, it's like the, the first thing I present about myself is not that I'm straight. Like that's, that is that is not the first, it's like, Hey, my name's Rachel and I'm straight. You know, it's like, and I think, I think in the same way, there has to be a letting go on both sides of like sexuality as a primary identifier. It's like, yeah. there, there needs to be like, th- yeah, we have to have a certain, not, I don't want to say detachment because sexuality is a beautiful part of who we are, but mm-hmm. I think there has to be a willingness on the side of the LGBTQ community and LGBTQ Catholics who want to come back to church. It's like, okay, you have to be willing to let us love everything about you. Like there are people here who want to love everything about you, every, and I mean everything, everything. But you have to, you have to be okay with letting this not be the first thing you tell me. Like, yeah. tell me your name, you know. And like, and I think I found that to be difficult in some conversations with people, and sometimes not, like with you, for instance. But like, there has to be a level of like, I know that culture tells you that this is your selling point this is your selling point to me it is not your selling point it's a part of you and i I want to converse about that i want to love that but this is not your selling point to me yeah and i think i think that's like that's respect to me is not this like i don't know yeah not not i know what you mean yeah what you mean i just i just had a friend who's really working on like accepting himself like asked me how i would feel about going to pride and I understand where that comes mm. from. Right? Like, he's like, I just want to be around other people who are like me, man. Mm. I just want to go and not feel like a freak. Sure. And I participated in the pride movement so much early on because that's what it did for me. It made me feel like I wasn't a freak. Sure. And I just got it. I had to be real honest with him the other day and be like, you know what? I totally understand where you're coming from. Yeah. But it would feel artificial for me to go there and feel like that is something that I need or where I want to be now. Yeah. Like, um, I know people want to like squabble about the, that it's called pride. And I don't think that's where most people are coming from. Like they're just trying to be like open about themselves or like they want really to like they I, belong. I, people go there to be loved. That's yeah. really like yeah. what people are looking for. And I was like, that was, that felt really useful for me uh, mm. because that's, that was my primary identifier. Sure. Everything about myself, I thought, I thought everything revolved around or was characterized by or influenced by or in some way touching my sexuality. And Mm. this is actually a friend of mine who's like preparing to come into the church. And I was like, 
I wouldn't say this is somebody who's not coming into the church, but like my identity first and foremost is like daughter of the king of the universe. Yeah. Amen. Dude, like period. Like yeah. that's full stop. Everything about me is yes. encompassed by that and encircled and embraced by that. And so yes. that doesn't feel like a space that I need mm. because I get what I need most of all in life in adoration at mass, like that has filled the emptiness in me more than any, any, any movement, no matter how much I agree with or not, like that's real food. Mm. That's real food. Wow. So yeah, that's been really hard for me to touch with like some queer friends. Cause it's like, you know, on one, um, you know, it's like, in one sense, I'm like, okay, go on with your bad self. Go do what you're going to do. Like, if you want to go, <laughs> you want to go, like, I don't know, like, go to the bar or whatever and, like, wear some beads. Like, it's not really bothering me. Right. Um, but, like, I just, I'm, like, losing friends. Not necessarily about this, but just, like, the more that I come into alignment with where I feel like I'm supposed to be rooting myself. Yeah the more whole I become. And it was interesting that you said that you, you know, you notice like how whole I seem. Mm, yeah. That's not what anybody would have said about me. Yeah. A few years ago. And I feel less and less attached to places and spaces that claim to fill me and make me whole. Mm. When I only, when I know that there's really only one place and one person I can get that from. Yeah. And do you think you would have learned that if you weren't queer? Yeah. I learned it so quickly. It just, no, no, no. Well, no. And um, because of the, I had to like do a big deconstruction period the past two years after graduation of like, oh, okay, let's sort through secular liberal education and figure out <laughs> what we're keeping and what is going in the donation pile because I, mm, and mm. I was like, I'm someone who was like, I, w I was in the streets many days last summer um really like trying to stand with brothers and sisters um in the black and brown community and like yeah. you know still feeling like secular progressivism was a home for the kind of like justice and change i want to see happen yeah and really the lord broke my whole heart like just in the last year about where change is possible and mm. who are changing where we get ideas of justice and love and mercy yeah. and, and uh, healing and reconciliation and like who we should be oriented towards. And I just, so I've had to, I've had to go through this process of like, where is my identity and what is it rooted in? It's, it wasn't just to do with queerness, but so I think I would have gotten around to it eventually, but I think at, I've just been undergoing that deconstruction overall Yeah, that forced me to really like, you know, another mirror moment of like looking at everything that I thought I really believed and that I put on a real high pedestal. With 2358, number one, a quick note. I love how, and this I think is overlooked, but how it says this inclination is objectively disordered. Not people. Like, I, I think that's so key mm -hmm. and that we miss that all the time is this inclination, um, a tendency is disordered, not a person. And so I, th I think any attack on persons is exactly what 2358 is getting at. Um, and it's just so tragic that it's been misinterpreted and used as a weapon against people and people's hearts as a whole. But one thing I love is the conclusion where um, it says like the they're called to fulfill God's will in their lives. And if they're Christians to unite to the sacrifice of the Lord's cross, the difficulties they may encounter from their condition. And that's something we, we talked about concluding on. So just kind of unpack, like, I guess we've talked about the suffering of marginalization, of shame, of not feeling like you belong, of, you know, not feeling at home with priests or, you know, people or just so many, so many different unique sufferings to LGBTQ community. Um, what can that teach us what can they teach us about what can you teach us about suffering and how to unite your cross to the cross of christ hmm. well i think um i think that all people can see themselves in the people that christ ministered to hmm. 
But when we think about who, and I've heard this is, these are not my direct, I can't claim this idea as my own because I, I know of another priest who he kind of put this idea out to his congregation yeah. after some mistreatment of a gay person in his, in his church. Mm. I think when you look at who are the social lepers of our day, Mm. I recognize myself in the leper. Wow. I recognize myself in so many of the people who Christ called by name and called his beloved. And I know that Christ sees me as beloved. Yeah. Um, the suffering part of that. And I think it was probably true for many of the people that he encountered and ministered to. Mm -hmm. was that they knew of his love and he knew of his love for them, but other people didn't. Yeah. And that's the suffering for me is like, mm -hmm. I have a deep abiding feeling of the Lord's love mm -hmm. from the Lord. I know that we have relationship, but you don't because you mm -hmm. see me as someone that is outside of being able to have that. Wow. And that, that's terrible. It's just a terrible experience. And just a quick side note on what you just mentioned too about the, um, the tendency or inclination. Straight expressions of sexuality can also be disordered. Oh, yeah. That's a whole podcast like, episode. Dude. I'm sorry. I run, like, a, I run a ministry based on the fact that, yeah. <laughs> like, like, this is, oh, geez. So, yeah, there, that just came up too. Like, But, yeah, the, the idea that, the idea that I can know God's love for me, but you're sure that it's unavailable to me, mm. that is like a deep sort of suffering. Um, so yeah, who are the social lepers among us? Because it's not just queer and trans people. It's, it's lots of us. Mm. It's lots of us. And I think all of us, there's some gospel narrative for all of us where we see ourselves in the healing that the Lord is doing or... Yeah. Um, and a person that he's speaking to or encountering. And it's like, just know that everybody else sees themselves in some way in that too. Mm. So if you can see yourself in Mary Magdalene or the leper or the Samaritan or the person the Samaritan was aiding, right? Like know that whoever you believe is like unable to experience God's love yeah. feels like one of those people too. Yeah. Like, so mm. that's the suffering for me. Like, and, and also I know that, um, you know, Christ knew that there was a plan for him and he knew of the brokenness of the world and that there was a solution to it and, and things that people could do and a place, a person, him to whom they could come. And mm. this brokenness would, would be, um, like his yoke is, is easy. The burden is light. Like, um, and yet he knew that people were just not, yeah, not, not feeling it, you know, he not. Also, yeah. He knew that he knew what it felt like to live, like literally live in the abundance of love from the father, like, and have other people deny that. Like, I think, yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. yeah. That's so powerful. Yeah. Like, and I, and I knew that's what you were getting at. And I think that's like, that's it. It's like, yes, Jesus literally lived in the love of the father constantly. He didn't always feel it necessarily I and mean, we don't know but that's i think that's a human experience um and i think he experienced his humanity in that way i.e the temptations in the desert but there's and, and until that final moment of abandonment on the cross i think it went up and down but like i think there's he literally lived in love with the father and with that abiding sense of that love and had everybody telling him around him like you are not who you say you are and you're blaspheming the father you are doing all of these like it i can't imagine that you know, but I think yeah. that is such a unique suffering that you're articulating um, that perhaps like, you know, perhaps that all of us need to learn um, how to accept in our own lives and unite to Jesus, but also just to stop doing to other people, you know, stop being the Pharisees that shout, you don't know the father at all, you know, that and just, you know, remove the beam from your own eye, friend. Yeah. <laughs> we all have a mighty beam, like, mm -hmm. We all have a very hefty beam and, um, you know, 
it's just it's bizarre to me to feel like yeah. we get to rank somebody's what we perceive to be somebody's sin like sure you know that we're gonna we're gonna create our own system of like hierarchy outside of whatever the church has handed us to um, make sweeping condemnations and generalizations and things like that that just seems bizarre and also like you know for the for the people who feel they don't have a place or they're they're queer they're trans or whatever um, this is for anybody but especially if you are baptized like by virtue of your baptism Mm. you belong yes you can't unbaptize somebody nope and so, you know, if, if people are like coming back and trying to wade into the waters and figure out where they are, I just want to say like, I love you and welcome mm. home and know that this can be home for you. Yes. Amen. Some, people can tell you all day that they don't want you here. They can tell you that you don't have a home here, but they can really never make you not belong. Mm. Man. So I think that's I think that's what we're going to conclude on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't think we can top that. Well, yeah, just thank you for being being with me, Jordan, and having this conversation and just for your own open book of a heart. It's just it's such a gift to me personally, but also just to our ministry and the ways you contribute. It's incredible. Um, thank you. And I know it'll it'll have a lasting effect on those who are entrusted to you. So just know that. But um, for those of you who might be listening and wondering about other communities where you can take um yeah where you can take identity where you can take those questions those struggles the feelings of marginalization i would highly recommend eat an invitation um jordan and i you probably have recommendations of your own and i would love to hear them um i have loved watching what eat an invitation does and i have several friends who I, i do think their lives have been saved by what eden does and just it's a beautiful place where they yeah they just talk about like I think their slogan is community beyond the LGBTQ paradigm. I think that's their slogan is like, we're going to be here as people. We're going to be here as children of God. And we're going to talk about our experiences and we're going to learn to grow in acceptance and peace of these experiences and these identities. But we are children of God. And I love that. So I would highly encourage you to seek out Eden Invitation. We'll put their website in the show notes. But do you have any resources or books or anything that you would like to recommend to just kind of as a final yeah, I mean, I know folks have their, like, again, people have their disagreements, but if, especially if you are a, a queer or trans person who is just trying to figure out if you are loved by the Lord and yeah. what that could look like, or if you have family members who you are just wrestling with and who maybe are, are in a good faith way trying to figure out how to be your family mm. and have it not break, um, Father Martin's book is good for that, actually. And I I have heard lots of queer people say that that book is really best for people who are trying to figure out how to encounter the, you know, sexually divergent people in their life, so to speak. I would agree. Um, Yeah. So there is that. Um, I've never personally encountered Eden Invitation. And like full transparency, um, the org I'm about to mention is like open and affirming. So that might not you know, I'm not promoting it one way or the other, but it's out sure. there and it exists. Um, and I, you know what? The, I'm I'm in their group chat. There have been things said that I don't jive with, that I don't agree with, that like I have a more, I don't know, orthodox position on. Mm. But it's just like a free group chat, right? Like they're not yeah. sanctioned every conversation that happens, but they're called Vine and Fig. Um, oh, yeah. I checked and- them out after you recommended. It was really yeah. beautiful. Yeah. 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 And I I mean, again, the open and affirming viewpoint is not what people are always looking for. And everybody's on their own. Everybody is in their own space and their own journey with that. But they have, I know for sure, saved people's lives just by having a Slack channel for like people to be who they are. Right. Um, You can be in there at whatever level of anonymity or transparency is comfortable for you. That's awesome. Um, That's awesome. Cool. Well, that's lovely. Um, man, we got to sign off, but it's been real. Yeah. Um, and for those of you who liked this episode, feel free to feel the words, feel free to share. Um, and if you haven't subscribed already, please do so on either YouTube or Apple or Spotify where we are present and hit the bell button. So it will notify you when there's a new episode out every other week. Um, but most of all, if you are kind of behind what we do and, want to help us first pray for us pray 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 for magdala 
Um, just pray for continued healing in the church in areas of sexuality and just how we approach each other's sexuality. But just pray for us and the work we're doing. We need your prayers more than anything. But if you'd like to join us financially, consider becoming a patron on Patreon. The link is in the show notes. We do kind of exclusive content over there, episodes, um, book studies, uh, sometimes Q&As, different things over there. So come and join us if you'd like to support us financially. But other than that, we will catch you on the flippity flip and God bless. Thanks for joining the conversation today on the Magdala podcast. If you want to learn more, join a support group with other women on the journey or find more content, visit magdalaministries.org. If you want to continue to be a part of the conversation, like, subscribe, and share this podcast. But most importantly, wherever you are in the journey of healing, know that you're not alone and you don't have to hide anymore. We're excited to welcome you to the table next time. God bless.